Hello, everyone. I hope you are enjoying today's conference. I'm so pleased to be able to moderate today's session about Alcove, revolutionizing youth mental health access. Um, you can use the chat and the Q&A tabs that are on the right to communicate with the other attendees and the presenters. So let's get started. Hello, everyone. So today we are going to be talking about Alcove and um, the mission. Um, our title of today's presentation will be Revolutionizing Youth Mental Health Access. And just to define that term, what we mean by that, um, we have defined, you know, revolutionizing youth mental health access as the main mission of the Alcove Youth Advisory Groups. And the very first cohort of this group um, identified it as well, as well as other core fundamental values of um, what we want to do with these youth advisory groups and, you know, the mission and the purpose of Alcove, which is to change um, how youth are talking about mental health and how youth are receiving mental health support. Awesome. Thank you, Lucia. We are so excited to be here and thank you for the opportunity to present to you all. Um, and now we're going to move into some intros so that everyone knows who we are. So hi, my name is Ana Lilia Soto. I am the Youth Development Manager with the Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing. And my main role is to support our youth development across all of our youth advisory groups. Um, Lucia, why don't you introduce yourself since you got to start us off today? Yeah, so hello, my name is Lucia. I am a sophomore at the George Washington University and I was part of the second cohort um, the Alcove Youth Advisory Group, and I'm currently a member of the Central Alcove um, Advisory Group, and I am originally from Palo Alto, California, but I'm currently in Washington, D.C. Thanks, Lucia. Phoebe, why don't you go next? Hello, everyone. I am Phoebe, and I'm a third year at the University of California, Irvine, so I'm from the Irvine area, and I am also a member of the Central Alcove Team Youth Advisory Group. Awesome. And let's move on to our third youth member today. Darien, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Darien. I am a senior at High Tech High Mesa High School in San Diego, California. And I'm also a member of the Central Alco Team Youth Advisory. Thank you, Darien. And my honor to first time present with my colleague here. Christian, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm Christian Cunial. Uh, I'm also with the Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing, and I'm an implementation manager. Uh, so I look at uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, delivering services to young people, and I'm so thrilled to be here uh, presenting to you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. So today, really, what we are going to do for you all is introduce Alcove to some of you. Um, also talk about our expansion. We're really excited to continue working with the MHS AOAC. And um, we'll be partnering with five more sites that you'll hear about um, in our presentation. And also, with everything um, that is going on, really talk about the connection between Alcove as a school link service to support our young people who are actively in school. And our other main goal is for us to have you hear directly from our youth the needs that, that they and their peers are experiencing. So with that, let's get started. So this slide really is just more about kind of highlighting the, the mental health crisis among young people. And a lot of us know these statistics in terms of understanding that 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness start by the age of 14, 75% uh, start by age 24. And we know that young people, um, that 79% of them don't access care. And so with, the, with that in mind, um, just really bringing the kind of the reasons as to why Alco started here in the US. And to hear a little bit more about that, we're gonna have some early insights provided by Lucia. Yeah, so um, our early insights come from our first youth advisory group cohort, as well as a national survey that looked at youth from California, New York, the Midwest. Um, and we really wanna highlight just on this um, seeking professional care requires a leap over a huge abyss and just acknowledging that um, seeking mental health care and 
focusing on your mental health is a very big step for youth. And um, as well as number five, engaging with mental health services often means going against family and cultural influences. And we wanted to acknowledge the pressures that come from family, the stigma around it, and um, just how it is hard for youth to even make the decision to go seek help. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight number six, that everyone is trying to solve young people's problems, but no one is truly listening. And that's why um, we have the Youth Advisory Group and Alcove really wants to highlight youth when it comes to creating mental health services for youth because you know, we're the only ones that really know what we're going through and the best way to support youth is by listening to what they want and their needs. And Christian will talk a little bit more about the mental health continuum. Thank you, Lucia. Um, so having, you know, heard those needs, uh, we've all kind of been tasked to kind of to work together to build some of those soft entry points that meet young people where they are, be that they be in school or in the community or, or needing to access, you know, um, more specialized services such as the early psychosis services. So Olka really sees itself as being one of the building blocks uh, in, on, that, uh, on the side of the continuum, it's really about prevention and early intervention. And the goal is really to be part of that collaborative platform that together with, you know, things like the school mental health services and the most specialized services, really build a continuum of care for young people, uh, recognizing really that no one service can do that on their own. Um, so yes, so that, that's kind of our goal uh, and vision. Uh, in being part of that continuum of care. And on to the next slide with Darien. So our name Alco was developed in our first cohort. Uh, it is a name that represents our core values. Um, it's cumulative of the words all and co, all representing the idea that our spaces are for all young people. Uh, no matter what emotions they're feeling or what backgrounds they come from, uh, communicates inclus inclusivity and togetherness. And the word cove representing a protected space that can take up on many words. And Alcove is meant to be a safe and open space available to any uh, possible that often go too much and supporting young people to reach out on their own terms. The next slide. All right. Thank you, Zadia. And you know, we're experiencing a little, um, t uh, we can't hear your voice sometimes. So just thought, wanted to let you know about that. But as we move forward to our next slide, let's hear from Lucia and talking about how this model is unique. Yeah, so Alco really wanted to focus on um, providing mental health care that's accessible to everyone and the main um, barrier being financial. So there's little to no cost to the young person when seeking mental health care and treatment. And we both do prevention and early intervention focus. Um, it's, we try to create a very youth friendly environment, um, trying to shy away from the very you know, stereotypical clinical um, mental health services. And again, just really highlighting on the fact that it is a youth centered environment and that is seen through our missions and values and just the design of the center and all of the staff there as well. Um, and then I will pass it on to Phoebe. So we do have our six core services and I want to highlight a few of them. The first being mental health, which is one of our main focuses um, at the individual group and even family level. If the youth requires it, they should be supported um, whenever they struggle with their mental health, um, along with this physical health. So going to their primary care and getting the necessary checkups, um, especially when it comes to sexual needs, which are often more stigmatized, even though that is an important part of your physical health and any checkups. Um, another one would be substance use um, support services. So if they need more personal care, then we should be able to provide that for them. And then peer and family support. So as 
um, we have mentioned before, the, we are the youth who have these lived experiences. So it's important to be listening to us when we do require something, especially when it comes to accessing mental health um, resources. So one of the best ways to be the support is by providing the resources, by listening, and um, overall just being more encouraging when it comes to sharing out. Um, our experiences. So the Youth Advisory Group will and um, continue to work with our overall Alcove team to ensure that there is transparency from being welcome to Alcove. Um, we want to be understanding and tailor these resources to the individuals who require them. And in doing so, we will hire staff that will be supportive and um, properly provide these services. So now I'll pass it back over to Lucia. So just some updates about where we currently are. Um, we have opened our alcove locations in San Jose and Palo Alto in June of this year. And that came out of a collaboration with the Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Services, which provided funding for a four-year pilot. And these two sites are the very first in the United States. Um, as you can see, we have um, similar locations with other models in throughout the rest of the world. And we are we do have five more sites planned throughout California, which Darian will talk more about. So Alcove is a growing network. Uh, in addition to the Palo Alto and San Jose centers, we have five new uh, projected centers. Uh, Alcove, Los Angeles, San Mateo, Sacramento, Irvine, and uh, Wellness in Los Angeles. Uh, we are receiving seed funding from the state of California through the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. We are also working with healthcare districts, county behavioral health services, the UC system, and nonprofit organizations to support our growth. And we have the Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing providing implementation assistance. Uh, back to Phoebe. So to complement all of our alcove centers, we do have youth advisory groups, um, and these are youth that make sure their voices are heard when we are constructing our alcove centers, just because um, these the, um, this is the population we want to cater to. So each local youth advisory group is a recognition of the fact that different communities have different needs and we should tailor. Um, tailor the advisory group based on the community. And we want to look through different lens, whether it's ethnic, gender identity and expression, lived experience, abilities, socioeconomic status, um, or um, of LGBTQ identities. So of course, lived experiences are validated as expert experiences. We are the experts of our own experiences. We know what we are going through. And in doing so and sharing our experiences, other people can better understand them. The youth advisory groups are necessary um, just to make the centers feel more youth friendly and welcoming by having peers of similar age ranges. I would feel more comfortable coming in um, and knowing where that they know where I'm coming from. Um, typically, if we were to have professionals of an older age range, it would feel more clinical and more uninviting. So the Youth Advisory Group also increases community awareness of mental health and alcove through their networking, outreach, and presentations. And through participating in the collaborative design of the spaces, consultation, and generating all of the ideas for workshops and trainings, the perspective of young people is started into the alcove's DNA. And then it will be back to Darian to talk about the mission values. So this in the image is our first cohort who developed our uh, Alco Youth Advisory Group mission, uh, vision, and values. Our mission is to empower young people to become the leading voice in redefining mental wellness, uh, reducing stigma, and increasing access to youth mental health support. Our vision is to revolutionize mental wellness resources for young people. Then our core values are on youth voice, so uh, fostering diverse, inclusive spaces, uh, empowering youth of all backgrounds to advocate for their mental health, 
uh, accessibility. So normalizing conversations around mental health and mental wellness, promoting social justice and educating communities on what it really means to be uh, what mental health and wellness really mean. And then mental wellness, of course, so fostering a space that is empathetic and free of judgment to all you. So um, next I will talk about the Central Alcove Team Youth Advisory Group, which myself, Phoebe, and Diana are part of. Um, so this was developed to ensure that youth were involved in the larger process of alcove development and implementation. Um, we, so all the alcove centers are going to have their own youth advisory group to focus on the, the individual development of their own center. Um, and this was modeled after the original cohorts of the youth advisory groups. And so the caddy, as we call it, will have opportunities to engage with other organizations and alcove centers to create a larger community and movement um, for youth mental health access and support in general. And our goals are to support cultural inclusive, inclusivity um, and really highlight and focus on the intersectionality of mental health and um, mental health support. And the Caddy is also here to support all the YAGs in mentorship, in mentorship and projects and um, just kind of working to make sure that youth voice is integrated on every single level in Alco's model. Now we'll bring it back to Phoebe and Darian for um, a little bit more on the opportunities for youth feedback. Go for it, Phoebe. <laughs> okay, so um, both Darian and I will be talking about opportunities for youth voice and feedback. So as you can see, we are involved with branding, um, who, um, what identities we want to shine a light on. And the name was developed um, with IDEO Ori in the first YAG cohort. Um, we're also involved in scouting locations, so when we see communities in need, we find that those would be the ideal location to have an Alco Center. Um, and in doing so, we would design the space, what it would look like, and the overall flow and the vibe of the space. Um, so along with that, we all help make decisions um, and provide input on what services we want Alco to provide. Um, which would be both in person and online, just so we can have more people access them and it would be easier to have access. And we also have marketing. So through our social media platforms, we create flyers um, and videos to go on our websites and different social media platforms. So this all highlights one of Alco's core principles, which is youth involvement. We want to create meaningful opportunities for youth to provide their insight and their own input for every outcome decision. And it's not just about having youth there, but we are the collaborators, we are the decision makers. So this input runs deep and touches every aspect of outcome's identity and activities. We also have our evaluation and data systems team, which I believe is called Team Indigo, um, who are like, you know, making sure that the resources provided by Alcove are actually helping the community, um, the more logistical side of things. Uh, the Alcove policies and procedures uh, group, we have. Um, Advocacy, adv sorry, advocacy training. Um, so increasing the dialogue on mental health and wellness, reducing stigma, uh, making it more normalized, especially in communities that deeply stigmatize mental health. Um, they also do community presentations. Um, so educating communities on mental health and the importance of mental well-being, and then our outreach and recruitment strategies. Awesome. Um, next slide. Thank you, Dad, Dadian. 
All right, so I get to share a little bit about some new statistics from Mental Health America from their 2020 report. And what we've seen, especially with the rise of COVID, with COVID and our young people transitioning to and fro from being sheltered in place to now being back in school and having to deal with just different situations and navigating what a worldwide pandemic We've seen that major depression in youth has increased 4.85% just over the last six years. And now we're seeing the starting numbers of over 2 million youth who have depression with severe impairment. So over 70% of our youth with major depression are still in need of treatment. And what this is highlighting for us, again, is one, the need to have accessible services for young people, as well as really building partnerships between different services and schools um, in order to make sure that young people in whatever space they are, are being able to receive services. And so um, right now, I just wanted to highlight some of our, men, our school mental health system challenges that we're seeing. And one of the um, core reasons why when we were developing ALCO, we wanted to be a school link service um, versus being at school service. And so we know that when it comes to our young people trying to access services, um, capacity, um, with having accessible mental health services because of the space, um, the issues of primary responsibility, turnover with staff, um, resources, and then we know um, that our teachers, rightfully so, deserve those vacations and summers off, which means that there's a couple months throughout the year that if they are receiving services through their school, that those aren't accessible. Um, when we also talked um, with our young people, they also highlighted different communication uh, between school staff and their parents as, as a need for them to maintain confidentiality and um, also informed consent, as well as the different HIPAA and FERPA laws that school mental health services um, have to really connect to and aspire. So those are some of the challenges. So as we were preparing for this um, presentation, as well as when we were um, just talking with our young people about the different needs that they're seeing, we reached out to some of our wellness centers in our community. And this is a little bit about from that conversation. Go for it, Christian. Yes, it was a really fruitful conversation. What they told us obviously is, you know, what we've all seen is that there's uh, students, you know, are having a very stressful transition back to school and re-engaging with yet another new normal. They've gone from Zoom fatigue and isolation to kind of social anxiety and feeling completely overwhelmed. Um, there's increased need uh, for, for support, you know, to support families to support their young people. And there's uh, always that still that uh, hesitation to access uh, wellness centers, um, you know, that are in the school environment. I mean, what are the, some of the staff have told us is that, you know, they've experienced increased uh, demand uh, in, in their services with therapist caseloads being full and, and them having waiting lists. So uh, there's a real concern around capacity, Anna. And um, I think I'll hand it back to you, I think. Yes, thank you. And so I think along with that, what we wanted to highlight today is like having you access to some live youth that they themselves can tell you what they've been going through, what they, they're seeing with their peers. And as young people, really highlighting youth-focused solutions and youth-focused direction. So now I'm going to get to talk to our youth one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and if there's any questions, again, please feel free to share um, anything in the chat, and we'll try to get to it at the end of the presentation. But the first question I'm going to throw out um, in a time for, and I'm going to have Lucia and Darien um, focus on this one. So in the time where students are navigating going back to campus, whether you're in high school, you're in college, what are you hearing from your peers? What are their needs? Um, why don't we start with Lucia? Yeah, so being on a college campus for the first time, um, a lot of, I think a lot of students are struggling whether or not we've been here or not is with independence and kind of figuring out how to live our own lives. We're like independent of our family and manage school and social life. And now COVID on top of that, it's, it's a big stressor. Um, and just trying to adjust to this new normal with COVID as well as this new, um, this new phase in our life. And I think that it can get very overwhelming and 
you know, not having a parent or a close um, or close friends check in on, who constantly check in on you and ask you who who how you're doing um, and having to kind of create your own support system with this new group of people is definitely um, something that I, I see a lot that um, college kids are struggling with. Thank you so much, Lucia. Dadia, what are you hearing from our high school young people in terms of what are the needs that they are expressing in terms of just returning back to school? And And we can't hear you, Dadian. Dadian, I think you're on mute. Oh, Sorry, to... <laughs> there you are. No I'm worries, the Zoom life, right? The Zoom life, all good. Um, I can hear you now, yes. Okay, uh, sorry about that. My Wi-Fi is a little bit um, spotty here. Um, but so yeah, after almost two years of distance learning, it seems that a lot of people are struggling with readjusting um, to coming back to school full time. Uh, I'm hearing that a lot of people the college applications do and everything. Uh, a lot of uh, my peers feel that they don't really have What's funny is that these dramatic pauses um, are like, there you go. You're, you cut out again. Time, Daniel, uh, to seek out mental wellness resources. Um, also, uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, what was the last thing I had said? Um, you were talking about seeking seeking out mental health resources. Uh, yeah, so a lot of my peers uh, are feeling overworked and feel that they don't have the time to seek out mental health resources on their own, um, or they feel that they can't like afford therapy sessions. Uh, we do have a school counselor, however, um, the meetings with her are confidential, but like, you know, your friends are going to know if you leave class for half an hour and then come back, like people know that you're seeing the school counselor and there's still a lot of stigma surrounding mental health. So I would say the biggest thing has to do with accessibility um, and confidentiality. Awesome, thank you. Kind of highlighting some of the concerns that we saw with our wellness centers, right? As they've also mentioned two of those core things in terms of confident confidentiality, as well as um, folks are impacted. And, um, and, you know, and then the whole thing, again, going back to confidentiality, where receiving services at school um, proves a little challenging when you when you feel vulnerable and other people know that you're trying to access services. Thank you. Um, I just received word that Phoebe's uh, Wi-Fi is crashing. And again, thank you all for being really patient. Right? Zoom life and trying to do things virtual is always uh, a little catch-22 there. But we'll just try to, to persevere and go on because that's what we do here. Um, so let's go on to the second question with how do we engage in people in accessing services at school? So, Danielle, you mentioned something really important about confidentiality. So um, what are your tips? What would you say for a young person who happens to be hearing us today, or even some of our school counselors, what would make it something a little bit more accessible for them? Um, well, I've always thought that one of the uh, most helpful ways to reduce stigma around mental health um, is maybe to advise people, like take five minutes out of your day to meditate or self-reflect and those five minutes a day sort of, um, they open up the conversation a little bit. They uh, help uh, in part to reduce stigma about taking care of your own mental health. And I think those small steps eventually push people to take 
um, you know, bigger steps and start reaching out to uh, mental health uh, resources in their area. Uh, yeah. No, that's great. I think um, you are talking about normalizing self-care as well as stepping outside of yourself in terms of how to, if, you know, being able to develop some cool grounding tips that kind of open you up to look in the different supports. Thank you for that. Um, Lucia, what about you? How would you, what would you say are some tips that you would advise some of our folks joining us today on how to encourage young people to access services at school? Yeah, I think one of the base issues for youth is that there's already such a big stigma against seeking mental health support. And when um, when a youth finally makes the decision to go seek help, um, the process is a bit intimidating. I think as young people, we are not used to you know booking our own appointments. We don't really know how insurance works, and it's all really complicated. And on top of accepting that um, maybe I, like, hey, I, I do need to see, talk to a professional. Um, speaking, having to like go through your parents' insurance just makes it a lot more complicated. Um, I also think that just the, the entire registration process is, is very confusing and intimidating. And it just, it's a very cold environment. Um, I would say that like, I really appreciate what Alcove does in making a very youth friendly environment when it comes to seeking mental health and mental health services um, and making it an experience that is very inviting and more like we want to help because mental health providers want to help. It just it, it is a very intimidating thing to go into, especially on your own. So making um, just promoting mental health services, making it talking about it on campus and just overall making it more youth friendly. Um, I think it would make it a lot easier for young people to you know give it a chance and try it out. Sure. Thank you so much. I think that was so insightful in terms of even highlighting what can happen at schools as well as um, schools having access to different centers where the confidentiality for that young person to be able to receive services, but talking about a different kind of environment that allows for that conversation to happen. So thank you for highlighting that. I think our last question that I wanted to ask you all is in terms of how can ALCO support schools to support their students? What would be some of the, the things that you both see, Phoebe and Lucia, about what is, what's the connection there? What's the potential bridges that we see? Why don't we start with Phoebe since I know your internet crashed and you made it back. Go for it. I, I did make it back. <laughs> so in response to this last question, I, I think that Alcove can serve two main purposes, at least on my campus. Um, the first being that um, I really think it would be helpful to complement the counseling services that we already have. Um, I'm not sure if this has been mentioned by my other team members yet, but the counseling at my school, there's always a super long wait list and students often feel like disoriented when it comes to counseling just because they feel like they can't get the help and support they need. Um, so by having a more like youth friendly alcove center where students maybe not get professional help, but they could get more um, peer support and people who really understand that, that would really help um, in getting them to like take the steps to receive more resources um, and more professional help and they wouldn't be feel or they wouldn't feel so deterred. And the second being like, I think it's just really important to have a physical safe space for students. A lot of students don't know where to go on campus and they feel like they can't really make campus their home. So having a wellness center where students can feel comfortable to meet other peers and faculty um, and just relax there, I think would be very helpful to their well-being overall. Awesome, thank you. Lucia, why don't you share a little bit about um, how you, you see the interaction between schools and Alcove? Yeah, so kind of adding on to what I said before about how Alcove really focuses on making youth comfortable, whether that is if you're you are seeing um, a professional or you're just talking to one of our peer support specialists. Um, it really just is um, is a space where you can go and we have um, like a lot of community events like movie nights and game nights 
And I think that when we talk about mental health, we think of really big and scary and serious topics when taking care of your mental health can just be like, hey, I maybe don't want to spend tonight in my dorm doing homework. Like maybe I want to go play games and meet some new people on campus. And it kind of builds like a, a community um, and a place that you can always go to. And I think that that being in the same area as counseling services will really open up people to the idea of like, oh, like I come here all the time for these casual events. Like I'm just more comfortable in this space and maybe I'll seek out services when I really need it. And just surrounding, creating positive associations with um, mental health and the mental health services on campus and helping familiarize students will make it a lot easier so that if and when they do want to seek out the support that they can. Nice, thank you so much for that. Um, why don't we keep on going with the rest of our presentation? Um, thank you all for sharing. Um, I think and being able to really align some of the goals of ALCO with some of the goals and supporting schools in um, trying to mitigate young people coming back and understanding of the increased support that is needed and how ALCO can help. And so we're going to have um, Phoebe do a recap of the conversation that we just heard. Go yes. first. <laughs> to sum up, um, most of the things we mentioned so far. So our current reality is that this is our new normal, whether it's a hybrid space or transitioning back to in person when we haven't been in school or been around very many people for almost two years now. And it's kind of jarring to go from almost total isolation to socialization. Um, people can feel like their social batteries are being drained. And even though they want to bridge connections and meet new people, it's also very exhausting and maybe even stressful. And can induce anxiety just because they've been isolated for so long. And there is trouble in accessing services. And one of the biggest barriers is confidentiality because on campus, people can see you walking into the physical space to access those services. So there's not very much privacy and confidentiality with that. And in seeking professional counseling services, um, their schedules are often very limited, so avail it's hard to match availabilities, especially when you have classes going on um, or you may not be on campus that day when the counseling center might be open. Um, I've also heard of students being referred out without their consent, so before they really gotten, have gotten comfortable um, re with receiving on-campus services, they were referred out just because their case wasn't um, something that the campus could handle. Um, so to address some of these issues, peer support is a really, really big thing, something that we've all been emphasizing. Um, it's normalized, um, we should normalize having these lived experiences. I mean, we all experience things differently, but it's still good to acknowledge that we do have our own struggles. So we should take the steps to address these struggles. How should we address these barriers um, and adapt and overcome together? So in doing so, we can connect peers and hopefully make services more youth friendly so people are more comfortable accessing them. Thank you, Phoebe. And um, now let's move it. Um, let's bring it back to, to Alco, where Christiana is going to highlight some of our model components in terms of bridging um, the support for schools. Yes, yeah, so back to uh, Alcove, this is just a nice diagram of the Alcove model. And as you can see, there's youth engagement, participation and development is kind of the central and ongoing pillar of the model. Uh, around the, that is, you know, the service provision is bringing about um, all the all the services that young people uh, have have asked for and need in, in one place. And then around those are some kind of enabling components of which uh, one I want to point out today is the community engagement and partnerships, which is on the top right hand uh, part of the of the diagram. And um, and if you can go to the next slide, I will uh, talk about building bridges. You know, and uh, we've already heard from Phoebe and Lucia and Darian so many ideas to build those bridges between schools and and services like Alcove. But I'll just you know I'll highlight uh, two two main areas where uh, we see opportunities. One is really uh, about increasing access to, to services. So how can these two uh, 
um, services together offer a, even more uh, a fuller menu of services to young people wherever they are. And uh, as we've heard, you know, Alcove has its own menu of services uh, that are in the community. And uh, Alcove centers may provide those services, you know, when the schools are closed or, or perhaps even provide an opportunity for young people as they're transitioning out of school, you know, when they've finished high school, they're going back to the community, going on to the next phase of their life, but they have yet to connect with any other um, uh, support system. Well, Alcov can be there for that as well. There's opportunities for referral to therapeutic and well-being group services, you know, whether young people come to the actual center to access those, or even as it, uh, you know, the center can actually do inreach into schools and provide some of those group services uh, in, in schools in collaboration. Uh, it's also an important opportunity for schools and uh, Alcove to consolidate connection between the school and the community and uh, ensure that young people know that there's always help there for them uh, wherever they are. Um, again, as uh, Lucia was saying, it's uh, the importance of peer-led mental health education to decrease stigma. So opportunities for um, the peer support uh, workforce that are in centers you know, either to go into, into uh, schools and do inreach or for students to access those uh, mental health education sessions in the Alco centers. And also hopefully Alco centers can provide, can support families to support their youth. Um, the other area of course is around youth development and uh, that being a core uh, tenet of Alco, uh, we really hope that uh, Alco can uh, collaborate with schools and provide leadership opportunities for students to participate in the local and the statewide advisory groups that we've just uh, heard a lot about in this presentation. Also to collaborate to support any other uh, school mental health initiatives such as uh, Bring Change to Mind and the NAMI high school clubs and really to provide opportunities for students to you know, take part in uh, community events and projects uh, that are kind of run by Alcove into, in the community. And on to the next slide. All right. Um, and this is just our information. Uh, thank you all for um, just staying with us um, through our tech difficulties. Um, but if you would like more information about Alcove, you can um, you can email us at alcoveinfo at stanford.edu, as well as Christian's and mine's emails. Um, and follow us at Alcove Youth and Stanford Youth MH um, to learn more about Alcove and um, where we're at. Um, all of the slides will be available to um, everyone participating today um, in our this, this session. And so now we have, we timed it so that we would have time for a question. And thank you, Jasmine, for talk, appreciating our youth perspective so much. Appreciate that. And definitely um, we, again, that core, um, that core thought about listening to our youth and really having them lead the ways is, is kind of what we've been definitely uh, working on with Alco. And I'm gonna, I love that you can heart things on here. All right, there's my heart for that. Um, so yeah, opening it up, if there's any questions from uh, the audience who's here today about Alcove, about the links that we see between Alcoves and schools, I think we've always seen ourselves as a partner with schools and supporting um, all of our students that are there. One of the big things about also being off campus is that we also wanted to reach out to young people who are not engaged with school, whether they're not engaged because they've already gone to high school and they're in college now, or they're not engaged because they weren't, um, it wasn't, they weren't uh, successfully connecting to school. And we also have a supported education and employment person that really targets those youth that works with different vocational schools and community colleges and four-year students. But we really wanted to be accessible for students who were in school and had services, as well as the young people that didn't receive any. Um, so we are, I love that everyone is hearting this uh, comment from Jasmine, so that's awesome. Um, yeah, so if there's any questions, um, Yes, thank you, Sabrina, for being, uh, for thanking us. Okay, I think things are there. Thank you, Kelly. All right, so we um, can stand by for maybe a couple of minutes, um, embrace the silence, um, and let's see if any questions pop up.
Yes, thank you. Um, Tracy asked, is there an opportunity for communities to become future alcove sites? Definitely there is. Right now we are working um, with the MHSOAC. And so Christiana Cunio is going to be one of your first target folks. If as a community you would like to learn what it takes to implement uh, an alcove. Christiana, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, and thanks for the question, Tracy. Uh, look, we're working with a lot of uh, communities who really have heard about Alcove and want to bring it to their community. And, um, you know, usually it's a, it's a pretty community-driven um, program. So usually it's young people in that community that really want to advocate for a different kind of service. And they, you know, they form a coalition with uh, either individuals or organizations that, you know, really have are invested in supporting the health and well-being of young people in their community. So we talk to anybody who is interested in hearing about Alcov and uh, help them find a path towards, uh, you know, developing um, or really scoping if Alcov is, is what um, is best fit for their need. Uh, and usually the first thing we encourage is to get the youth voice, uh, you know, developed. And that's where Anna kicks in and the, and the caddy uh, and helps make sure that um, uh, whenever uh, young people uh, need to have a voice, that we help them, uh, you know, uh, make that voice really loud and clear, and uh, and that uh, any individuals, organizations, or adults really orient uh, orient the, their work around the voice of a young person. But again, anybody can contact us through the contact details that we've left, and uh, we're happy to speak to any community that wants to have an alco site. Also, I wanted to highlight that um, we work with different community organizations. So uh, in Santa Clara County. We're working with Santa Clara County Behavioral Health, as well as in Sacramento, we'll be working with their behavioral health services. But throughout the state, we're working with, like we mentioned before, a UC system, we're working with different nonprofits, um, with different organizations that kind of have um, just different needs for their alcoves. And, and one of the cool things about alcoves is how flexible it is. So there are those five, six core components, but our youth advisory group, our community consortium, really make it more part of that community. So that's one of the most exciting things about Alco being able to work with a community and having it fit for theirs. Um, Tracy Este also asked, um, I'm sorry if I missed it, but I am also curious if you can share more about the peer support model. How are youth training integrated into the center services and workflows? Um, sure. So we, um, each of the ALCO sites um, hire peer support specialists and they go through um, a training through, we've, we've worked with Youth Moves and so they did a training with our peer support. But also um, the model here in Santa Clara County, the community uh, engagement piece is, is um, with LMR Counseling Center. So a lot of the training also comes from them. So. We definitely talk about boundaries and how do you really effectively um, utilize your own lived experience to support other young people who are under, um, who are going through their own mental health recovery and how do you really walk people into normalizing help seeking behaviors. And so that is something that's wrapped up into, into that model. Um, right now in Santa Clara County, one of our inaugural YAG members who actually worked with us um, as a YAG member for two years he is now one of the peer support specialists. So um, being able to have him understand the ALCO model really actually has supported in making sure the peer specialists involved in ALCO really understand the youth voice component, how, how to integrate young people into their own services. And um, But we're definitely trying to um, work with different um, it's the organizations who peer support is one of their things to, to support in the development of ours. Christian, do you want to add anything to that question? Yeah, I just want to add, um, Tracy, to answer your question that, you know, indeed, I think we're going to have to develop uh, a new a new model for peer support uh, because uh, most models come from an adult uh, environment. And so I, we're, we're hoping that as we work with Alcove and we roll out and we develop uh, what uh, what peer support really means in the youth and kind of prevention and early intervention space. That you know we're able to really tailor the model and and hopefully you know have that reflected in um, you know a future training that's provided for peer supports for those that do uh, want to you know start continue to focus on youth. 
uh, in their peer support work. So it's, it's a bit of a developing project. Um, we're going to be working with all our sites to actually, you know, really, really hone in on what, what is the peer support model for Alco. And definitely what it looks like for each of the communities, right? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, if uh, we'll do another couple minutes, and if we don't have any questions, we will give folks back 10 minutes of their day. Sure, you are asking about substance um, use in Alcove. And so um, it is part of the clinical services. And actually we talked to our youth um, when we were developing this. And so um, they wanted folks that could talk about substance use, but we're not a substance abuse treatment center. And there's a really clear defining um, rule in that in, in terms of we will support young people being transitioned if substance use is one of the, their biggest issues that they really want to work on then we will support them in transitioning to higher level need services but definitely um, conversations about self-medicating in terms of when you're going through something those are um, conversations that we do have at our center i hope that helps christian i don't know if you want to add anything about substance use well, just to, the, you know, it is a kind of a, the brief intervention model. It's really about, uh, you know, speaking to young people who need that um, assistance early. And then just like Anna said, if it, it sounds like it's a very challenging area of their life, then uh, really providing that supported transition uh, to uh, a more specialized service and continuing to work uh, with that young person because they could be receiving those services in parallel, you know, they could be coming to Alco for group programs or, um, you know, continue with counseling and still be uh, accessing those more specialized services uh, as they proceed, you know, with that with that pathway. Um, Tracy just said she's going to stop questions and I was like, keep going, we're enjoying. So um, if there's any folks that want to ask questions of our youth, definitely feel free to throw that into the chat as well. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. All right. Um, I think that since we haven't seen any other questions jump in, how about I ask our youth a question? Any final words that you would like to share with our folks today in terms of young people? Um, what kind of like advice do you want to share with them in terms of how they're reaching out to their folks? Um, anything? What are some last words for you? All right. And then we have an actual question, another question for you. So I'll let you think about mine. Let's go into Ashanti's question to the youth. How do you feel engaged when making decisions? Um, Lucia, this one is more for you since you've been with us for a couple of years and gotten to make some decisions. And then we'll bring in Darien and Phoebe in terms of your two month activeness on Caddy. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure if this is um, answering your question, but Definitely, um, like I said, Alcove really tries to highlight youth voice. So what happened when I was working, when I was um, part of the youth advisory group is that Anna would come and bring us prompts and we would have a discussion about it. And she was really brought us ideas and said, you know, go crazy with it. Like any, whatever you want, like I will try to make it possible. And she really didn't set us, give us any limitations and really just um, encourage us to find like deep down like what is the most ideal thing that we could do for youth and to help you support in your mental health journey and when seeking mental health support and then you know we would talk about the about the actual logistics and what is what is possible with resources and I think that Alcove does with the main focus being on youth voice it really encourages not only just 
with like youth advisory group members and with the caddy, but really highlighting on like youth needs in the community. And um, now with this focus of like cultural awareness and intersectionality, like we try to focus on who's missing from the conversation and how do we bring them in. So everybody is being, um, so everyone is getting the best out of all of these decisions. And I really do feel that I'm making a difference, um, which is, which is really exciting because I feel like being so young and being in high school and now in college, it's it's really great to be able to feel like I'm actually making a difference with the work that I'm doing and that people are actually listening to me. And it's a really great step um, when it comes to you know youth care in general, whether it be mental health or anything else. Um, thank you. And Dadiane and Phoebe, I know you both are new to the caddy, but um, I guess it would be for you both. It's like, how would you feel engaged when making a decision, or what have you seen that is kind of is opening doors for that for you right now? Oh, I can't hear you, Danian. What happened? Oh, I'm lost sorry. Oh, there you are. Go for it. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question really quick? Uh, I've just been having a lot of connection issues. I know, but you know what? First, let's appreciate and thank you for being here. Darian is at school um, trying to be here and voicing youth voice um, for you all. So no worries. Thank you for being here. Um, so my question was in terms of, you know, how the question that was thrown out to you all was, um, how do you feel engaged when making decisions? and um, I guess that's a question that's actually going to have me learn about you since Dadian and Phoebe just joined our caddy and I think we've had three meetings now or four meetings I think from last night. Um, but how do you feel engaged when making decisions and so um, within Alcove or just within other places that you've been able to support and grow? Uh, well, I think I would say what matters the most is that um, I feel engaged about making decisions um, that I can see have an impact on my community and I can see that there is a purpose to what I'm doing. And with Alco, I can see that there, like, everything is very intentional and it all has a purpose, which was what got me interested in Alco in the first place is sort of having like, you know, a purpose behind everything, something that I'm passionate about and feel really interested in furthering the discussion about mental health, especially in youth communities like mine. Awesome, thank you, Darian. Phoebe, you're, um, you are one of our caddy members is actually gonna come from one of the sites that we're gonna build and so, what are the, the hopes that you would want to see as we support UC Irvine in bringing Alcove and, and you as a member of the caddy? Yeah, so I am super excited to see the Alcove space that will be um, housed within my school and I guess being the president of the organization that's currently taking on that project and planning the space um, and getting feedback from the students. I think like feedback is so, so important and it's really helping us make the decisions when it comes to what do students need right now or what do they want to see on campus that isn't already here. And I just feel like super excited just thinking about it because I know my team loves like working together and they have a really they have really big visions and I hope like we can accomplish all of these goals and another thing is that I feel like people are actually listening to what I have to say whether that's during like the caddy meetings or the team members and even connecting to my school through the deans um, the, um faculty and administrators they are they all want a part um, in or they all want a role in alcove and kind of being that touch point for them is like one of the best parts i guess knowing that i can make a difference and have like an active voice in it awesome thank you now we're definitely really excited that you're 
uh, playing these dual roles, right, and supporting the actual Irvine Youth Advisory Group, as well as being here to, as part of CADI and, you know, supporting statewide growth and development and campaigns with our young folks. So I think I am going to just thank you all for joining me and being part of this awesome presentation. I appreciate our youth advisory group members for, you know, taking time off their school days. Darien, thank you for dealing with all your tech issues and Phoebe and Lucia taking time again from your school uh, for being here. So thank you all. Um, my folks out there, um, the PowerPoint will be shared. All of our information is on there. Thank you so much for staying with us. Um, and hopefully, as they, we all got to support and you know our youth, young people learning today, as um, as well as learning a little bit about Alcove and the group, the growth that we hope to do with all of our school partners. So thank you all, and have a beautiful day. Thanks so much.